No, it's online, but I read. Good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all here, uh, despite the fact that it looks like that outside. Uh, I can never figure, I don't know why we changed the clocks to summertime so early in the year. It doesn't, what am I supposed to do with this extra daylight that I'm saving? Like just <laughs> look out in the evening in despair uh, at the pile of snow at the end of the driveway, a little bit of extra light to sort of feel miserable about things. But anyway, here we all are. Um, I think I sent a reminder just a little bit ago. There is a quiz today, uh, same kind of format as before. So the quiz is online, uh, 12 questions, multiple choice, randomly chosen, same thing as uh, quiz one and quiz two. Uh, it will cover information from uh, the induction, in, inductive reasoning, uh, deductive reasoning last week, uh, and also uh, the context, motivation, and mood uh, content from this week. So uh, three uh, chapters worth of material. Any questions on that while I get myself set up over here? I guess my thought is I kind of don't mind having the time change in the summertime but I don't really need the extra daylight in the evening right now. I kind of like it in the morning when I actually need daylight. I don't even need it in the summertime. I mean, like in the end of June, like the sun doesn't set till like 10 o'clock at night. I don't really need daylight at nighttime. I sort of like it in the morning, but whatever. Um, so let's talk about context, motivation, and mood. And this is a good way to start. Um, how many of you drive to campus uh, or take a bus to campus? Uh, or some sort of non, well, actually, even if you walk to campus, but if you drive to campus, uh, sometimes you face this type of thing, right? Um, you uh, deal with people lined up in really bad weather. So how many of you have driven in this kind of weather before and found it stressful? It is kind of stressful, right? It's anxiety producing. Um, you don't know exactly how much control you're gonna have over the vehicle. You've got vehicles in front of you and you've got somebody behind you uh, who you don't know what they're going to do, right? So this requires a lot of attention, uh, requires a lot of concentration. I mean, driving in general, uh, when you first learn how to drive, is a resource-intensive, cognitive resource-intensive process. You're learning how to control a big vehicle, uh, learning how to control uh, your reaction times. So it's not a simple thing, but most of us learn to automate it. Uh, it becomes an automatized process, which means that we don't require active access to attention. We don't usually require much working memory. Uh, and we can usually do a lot of the driving, uh, so a lot of the motor activity involved with driving outside of our uh, conscious control. I mean, you've probably driven places and not really thought about where you're going while you're driving. Uh, we do that when we're walking and anything else that's automated. You can sort of ignore what you're doing because you're so used to doing it. But when something interferes with that and makes it harder, uh, it requires a lot more attention. It's like becoming a beginning driver all over again, right? You really gotta pay attention. So what I want you to think about is suppose you've driven to campus uh, in a lot of traffic, uh, stressful morning coming in, maybe not so much because March break has started, but uh, there's a lot of traffic, there's a lot of bad weather. Uh, and then the very next thing you do after you park uh, is you have to do something that requires uh, paying attention in a different way. Uh, so for me, that might mean teaching, right? So after driving here uh, in stressful conditions, I then have to, 10 minutes later, uh, engage in something that requires a different kind of attention. Or you as students uh, have to engage in a different kind of attention. So lots of stress getting here. Now you've got to switch back. Uh, in a really stressful situation, uh, this, this can interfere with your ability to pay attention. Uh, it can interfere with your ability to be at your best. So when one thing requires a lot of cognitive resources, and then you have to switch and do something else that also requires cognitive resources, uh, it can you can have uh, some cognitive fatigue. Uh, it can reduce your performance. All things being equal, uh, if this is more important, you don't want this uh, to interfere with it, right? Um, if you just Google image search professor, you usually get something like this. It's almost always a middle-aged uh, white man uh, talking in front of a chalkboard, usually with math uh, in front of it uh, and a tie on. So go ahead and do a Google image search for professor. You'll get someone who either looks like Einstein or this guy here. 
Um, what about this? Suppose you're driving. How many of you have ever had to go on a long car ride with uh, annoying siblings in the back? Uh, that can be stressful for the driver. These are not my children, by the way. I just did a Google image search on kids fighting in the back seat of a car, and this is what came up. Uh, so whoever these kids are, uh, they're fighting in the back seat of the car. He's antagonizing his sister. She's obviously aggrieved about something. They're all strapped in car seats. Uh, he's laughing because he's not in a car seat. He's out to lunch. Uh, but the three of them are making a, noise, making a lot of ha hassle back there. And obviously, whoever's piloting the vehicle, uh, how many of you have ever driven a vehicle with lots of noise in the background, whether it's your friends or siblings carrying on? That can also be stressful, arguably more anxiety and stressful, uh, stress-inducing uh, than driving in uh, bad weather conditions. Uh, because what's at stake here even more so is you've got to pay attention to the road, but you also have to use a lot of cognitive resources, a lot of uh, inhibitory control, executive resources, to actively ignore, ignore what's going on behind you. You've got two competing sources of information. You've got the road in front of you. Obviously, that's important because if you take your eyes off the road, you could have an accident. However, you've got to fight against the natural impulse to deal with uh, children making demands uh, on your time, right? It's a natural thing to pay attention to your kids if they're squabbling or making noise or calling for your attention or crying or whatever it is. Uh, so what you need to do as the driver in this case uh, is actively inhibit paying attention to the children behind you. That requires a lot of executive function and that taxes your working memory. It taxes your executive function. So imagine in the scenario where you've driven to work this way with children behind you making a lot of uh, noise. And then the next thing you need to do is science, very careful, uh, uh, concentrated science. You need to pay attention uh, and you need to be able to make observations and focus. Uh, likely your performance is gonna be less than less than optimal. Uh, if you've driven in relative peace and quiet, uh, you will have conserved some of your cognitive resources. Uh, your ability to inhibit distractions uh, will be less impaired, a little bit more preserved uh, so that you can, um, uh, so that you can uh, pay attention to what's going on the screen. Speaking of paying attention to what's going on the screen, it just occurred to me that I didn't share my screen uh, with the other folks at home uh, who are watching. And has anybody mentioned on the chat, by the way? Uh, not yet. Because uh, you, can, you can go along with the slides, of course. But those of you watching at home, sorry about that. I wasn't paying attention because I drove to work. Actually, it wasn't very stressful getting in. Um, so situations affect your thinking. Um, let me go ahead and pause here for a minute. I don't know why I just thought of that now. So I am recording. That's good to see. Uh, but I never shared. Sorry about that, uh, the 25 of you watching on the screen here. Let's go ahead and share my screen now. Uh, go back to this. Uh, and now I'm screen sharing. Good for me. I just realized I didn't see myself up there and I hadn't hidden uh, the floating meeting controls and something was amiss. So situations that you're in can affect your thinking ability. And the reason it's gonna be important, I'll show in just a few slides, uh, is that as our cognitive resources are tapped, we're more likely to make decisions, solve problems, and make inferences with input from system one if system two uh, is unable to operate. Remember, system two, uh, that sort of active, reason-based, language-based, uh, slower thinking process requires more cognitive resources. It takes more time. Uh, it's more energy. Uh, it consumes more cognitive energy. It consumes more actual energy, right? Uh, it's more uh, it, you know, it's higher metabolism when you're concentrating hard, trying to inhibit something and pay attention to something. It uses calories, right? So this is a, an active form of thinking. Uh, and if some of those resources are depleted temporarily, you're more likely to res uh, you know, use system one which is fine. That's what system one is always there for, is to be able to make these decisions quickly and efficiently with minimal processing. But sometimes uh, it means you're going to make mistakes. Uh, and so you're more mistake prone. Uh, your current mood also uh, ha has a similar effect. And we're going to talk about both of these things. In the first half of the lecture, we'll talk about uh, situations. In the second half, we'll talk about mood and also a little bit more about some situations. Uh, but your mood can also affect thinking. Positive or negative experiences can affect how you make decisions, reason, and think. 
because positive and negative experiences can constrain your attention. Uh, they can consume resources. If you're worried about something or happy about something, it changes the way in which uh, your uh, resources are allocated to different cognitive processes. One thing that seems to be true uh, in a number of studies that we'll talk about later in the second half uh, is that positive mood, being in a generally good mood, has been associated with greater cognitive flexibility uh, and openness to experience. So if you're in a good mood, you're more willing to try uh, alternative solutions. Uh, you're more willing to uh, be somewhat flexible in trying to solve problems. Um, if you're in a negative mood, uh, in particular, sort of an angry mood. Uh, so if you're irritated with something or kind of angry about something, uh, we tend to focus our attention, uh, a narrower focus of attention. There are likely uh, some evolutionary reasons for that. If something has put you in a negative or a fearful state, you want to concentrate to find exactly what is causing that negative and fearful state. Right? So those sort of negative emotions uh, can change your attentional focus, which means it can change the way you solve problems. You might miss information if you're focused on one thing. You might miss some information uh, that's relevant to solving the problem later on. Sadness, on the other hand, uh, so just sort of a general sadness, is often associated with a slightly broadened uh, attentional uh, scope, uh, but not necessarily cognitive flexibility. Uh, so we'll talk about all of these things today. Um, and we'll talk about them within the context of this dual process account, which we've talked about in a few uh, different lectures. Uh, remember, our system one is fast and intuitive. It's associative. Uh, it works in parallel, so it can do multiple things. Uh, and when you've uh, gotten really good at doing something, uh, whether it's a behavior or an action or a cognitive action, uh, we can sometimes offload it to system one by you know, referring to our knowledge. Uh, the, more, the more experienced you are with a certain domain or a certain thing, the more likely you are to be able to use system one effectively because you have a lot of past experiences to help you drive your decisions and to help you drive thinking. System two, of course, is this other way of solving problems and making decisions and thinking. Uh, it's our slower verbal reason-based system. It's serial and deliberate. So we need to actively engage in solving a problem as opposed to just making a quick uh, decision. It can sometimes override uh, system one, and system one can sometimes override uh, system two. We're not going to go through all of this because we've uh, talked about this in previous slides, but just as a refresher, uh, there are lots of different features which are typically correlated uh, with systems one and two. Um, this system one has a high capacity, so you can do lots of things. Um, it also produces biased responses. Sometimes you're not aware of them because it's a non-conscious uh, system. As opposed to our uh, system two, which uh, tends to be abstract and controlled. Uh, when uh, you're making decisions or engaging in behaviors that involve rule processing, uh, you need system two to be able to hypothesis test and select the rule and evaluate whether or not the decision rule uh, was the right one. Uh, and of course, we talked about some of these biological and evolutionary uh, hypothesized underpinnings to these different systems, uh, that one is similar to an animal cognition, a non-human animal cognition way of doing things. Maybe it evolved earlier, and it relies on brain areas that are uh, more early, that have evolved uh, earlier, as opposed to our sort of new mind, uh, which seems to be limited to humans uh, and maybe has some correlates in non-human, you know, more advanced non-human primates. Um, depends on explicit knowledge, and it seems to involve uh, sort of complex uh, emotional processing. So all of these I suggested, uh, one of the things that's good and bad about system one is that it gives us fast uh, responses. Uh, it can allow us to make decisions quickly and to solve problems quickly. And we've talked a little bit about some of these biases, but I want to talk a little bit more about each one of them. Um, this is a table from the textbook. Um, not all of these are on the quiz, by the way, but as I'm sure you know, uh, anytime anything is listed in like tabular format uh, in this class, it can be a good general heuristic uh, that it might show up in uh, a quiz or a final exam. Uh, 
Uh, so likely I'll ask about some of these and I'll ask you to define them or I'll give you a definition and maybe I'll ask you to fill in the definition uh, with the correct term. Or I might ask you to give an example of something from the lecture, from the textbook or from your own experience and describe why it might be uh, closely related to one of these different biases. There's a much bigger list of cognitive biases and some of you have probably seen that wheel of cognitive biases. Have you ever seen that? And there's like hundreds of them, uh, but they're all kind of related. They're all sub, you know, each one of them is like a subtype uh, of some of these basic cognitive biases. And you might think about it in terms of the uh, superordinate, basic, and subordinate level of categories, right? There are some basic uh, cognitive biases, and these are the basic cognitive biases that we've talked about. Um, we've talked about some of these already. We'll continue to talk about some of them for the next two or three lectures. Um, anchoring uh, is one that's really common. Uh, so anchoring is a cognitive bias, uh, makes use of system one because we tend to perceive things and make decisions uh, on the basis of what's in front of us. Um, anchoring is basing a judgment on a common reference point or a highly salient example. Uh, for example, if you're given the, uh, the option uh, to donate money, um, or, and this is one that's become a really big uh, issue lately, uh, is if you're given the option to provide a tip or services. Now, I don't know how many of you have worked in the, in the serving industry. Uh, most people who work as restaurant servers uh, are being paid uh, partially from uh, tips, right? So, I mean, that's part of your salary uh, if you're a server. That's not true if you work at a counter, right? If you work at a coffee counter, uh, and you're providing service, you're being paid uh, a minimum wage or above minimum wage uh, for that same job. So the tip doesn't necessarily become part of your expected salary. Uh, so servers are paid a lower than minimum wage in order to allow the tips to make up some, some of that. But many people, and I'm sure you've probably noticed this as we've switched over from uh, cash and card payment into uh, Apple Pay and uh, Android Pay, uh, is the, the Companies have switched over to point of sale terminals, which by default give you the option to tip 20%. Uh, and how many of you have sort of felt a little bit kind of aggrieved at being asked to tip 20% when you buy a coffee uh, at a counter? I'll be honest, I don't always like it. I mean, I do, because, but I feel bad not doing it on the other hand, because the person's right there, right? And they can see what I'm doing and they can see me not tipping. Um, so it does come up. On the other hand, if you're on the other side of it, if you work at a Starbucks, uh, you are going to get that tip money, right? I mean, that's eventually going to be uh, circulated among the people who uh, work at the particular place. So uh, it's something that has been made possible by the device itself, by the fact that we're paying with a phone and the merchants are using terminals, which have a default setting, which give you 15, 20, or 25%. How many of you have seen tips up to 30% as a default option? Uh, so that's an anchoring case because it doesn't give you no tip as a clear, obvious first default option. Uh, it doesn't give you 10% uh, as a clear uh, option. I might be willing to tip 10% uh, for getting a coffee at the airport. I might not be willing to tip 30%, but it gives you those options because it wants you to anchor your response. I suppose the company that makes the service that collects the payment, whether it's the Apple Pay terminal probably takes a really tiny bit of every transaction that's made on that service too. So maybe it, maybe it benefits them to offer that as a default option. So not only is the merchant getting the tip that you offer through the Apple Pay, but the company that makes the terminal and the service that they use takes a little tiny percentage as well. So it probably benefits everyone uh, to encourage you to tip a little bit more. Uh, the anchoring is that, so when given the option to donate money or tip, people donate more when the options begin at 20 than when they begin at one. So system one just sees the numbers, right? Well, tip 20%. Okay, yeah, easy enough, tip 20%. It's like going to the, uh, whether it's a, you know, a kiosk where you order the touch screen, add bacon for $1, okay. You know, you might not, might not have wanted to add bacon if it hadn't been made so easy, right? You're seeing those things in front of you and you're adding uh, things, uh, you're making your decisions based on what's immediately in front of you. Anchoring uh, is one of the reasons this happens. So you provide a fast answer by considering options closer to this anchor that is right uh, in front of you. 
Availability is basing a judgment. We've talked about this one a lot uh, on information that is available in memory or that is easily accessed. Uh, so it's the ease of access that becomes the cognitive cue uh, to the answer. Uh, system one bases judgments on the information that is easiest to retrieve, which reduces the demands. Whatever comes easiest uh, is likely to be an answer that you can use. We've talked about confirmation bias uh, last week, uh, the tendency to seek information that confirms what we believe or confirms an existing uh, decision or judgment. This can reduce cognitive processing needed for the task by reducing the number of options to consider. Uh, you can consider lots of different options. And we've talked about this problem when we talked about induction and deduction, the idea that there are lots of things to consider. Uh, even that Gru Emerald example had to do with how many options there are to consider, and yet we consider the one that is the most sensible and likely correct. Uh, that's a confirmation bias, a building on that tendency to reduce the number of options. Um, so some of these we've talked about, some we will in the future. Framing effects is one we're going to talk about uh, next week. Uh, so framing effects occur when the context around a judgment or a decision affects how that decision is made. Uh, so how you've described something. Uh, this will come into play a little bit uh, today when we talk about a promotion focus or a prevention focus. Uh, in many cases, the same goal can be achieved by trying to uh, achieve things towards a goal or trying to prevent a loss of not achieving that goal. One is a promotion focus, trying to get something. The other one is a prevention focus, trying not to lose something. That frames the decision and it frames the behavior in a way that changes uh, your alternatives. A recency bias uh, is the tendency to base judgments and decisions on the most recent examples, uh, not necessarily the same as the availability heuristic. Uh, in this case, it's just the most recently uh, provided example. This related to availability and assumes we remember and place more weight on recent cases. Uh, so it may not be the same, uh, though it is a related uh, idea. We've also talked about representativeness, and this is where we have a tendency to treat examples as a representative of its category. It reduces the cognitive demands because it takes advantage of these sort of familiar concepts and our tendency to generalize. So what all of these have in common is that we're trying to make things easy for ourselves. Uh, our cognitive system, our brain and our mind uh, is trying to do things as easily as possible. It's trying to use the least amount of energy as possible, uh, and it's taking advantage of all of those things uh, to do it. Uh, so making decisions without uh, needing to go into lots of cases, which are probably not uh, the right answer. Does that seem pretty clear so far? So the reason I bring this up is that the cases we're going to talk about today, whether it's positive mood or negative mood or complex uh, situations that you're uh, faced with, uh, all have to do with reducing uh, your cognitive demands. And one of the things that holds a lot of them together too uh, is the idea of the amount of energy that it takes to inhibit responding to something. Uh, inhibitory control takes a lot of effort. Uh, you can see this in most of our uh, sort of daily interactions. Now, we talked about in the first, very first lecture, talked about how uh, people sometimes are distracted by their smartphones, right? Uh, we suggested that it doesn't, just having a smartphone with you uh, or owning a smartphone or using a smartphone isn't necessarily going to affect your cognitive processing. Um, but how many of you notice that your tendency to want to distract yourself with your smartphone increases when you're tired uh, or increases like in the evening? I'm much more likely to doom scroll uh, like after dinner, eight o'clock or nine o'clock, and I just don't really feel like doing anything else, uh, I'm tired. My cognitive resources have been depleted and the ability to inhibit paying attention uh, is just not there anymore, right? Uh, or when something's uninteresting, uh, if this class started veering into a really uninteresting territory, uh, that's when your eyes are gonna glaze over. I don't mean that you specifically, that's when one's eyes are gonna glaze over. Uh, and they're going to start thinking, I wonder what's going on on TikTok. Uh, and then maybe you'll sort of drift over and start looking at some things. Uh, that's when, uh, you know, when it feels like it takes a lot of effort to ignore something and it's easier to just shift over and do the easier thing. Uh, that inhibitory control is resource intensive. 
So that's why I want to talk about this. Now, I've talked about this marshmallow test example in my cognitive psychology class. How many of you have seen this already? Um, how many of you have not seen uh, some of this? So let me go through it anyway. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail than I did when we talked about this. And when I taught about this in cognitive psychology, it was two years ago, right? It was 2021. Uh, so it's like a year and a half ago. So those of you that were in that class with me, we used this example, um, but we also didn't have as much time to talk about it. Uh, and the reason we didn't have as much time to talk about it, if you remember, is we had a strange format for that class where it was kind of a hybrid format where I got 50 minutes of lecture and then I had to come up with like 50 minutes of online lecture to supplement it. It was kind of a weird format for the class because of the uh, way we were trying to ease people back into in-person lectures. So I didn't probably have as much time to go into it as I wanted to. So uh, just bear with me if you've seen this before, um, but this is a really good example because for one thing, we're all familiar with it. Even if I didn't go through the, ex even if you didn't see me go through this, the example in uh, 2135, uh, you're familiar with the idea, right? The idea of the marshmallow effect or the marshmallow test has entered popular consciousness. And the basic idea is that little kids and all of us, when we're essentially reduced to little kids because we're tired uh, or exhausted or whatever, um, we just can't resist immediate gratification, right? We can only hold out so long, uh, whether it's a marshmallow, uh, a smartphone, or the tendency to, I don't know, how many of you have something that is uh, important to do on Friday uh, that's like class related? Uh, or maybe something that's important to do over the weekend, right? So you might need to balance your tendency. I mean, do people start going out early on St. Patrick's Day morning? I think the bars open up early, right? So if you're if you're interested in socializing on a Friday, uh, you've got to I have to inhibit that, right? Maybe you've got stuff you need to do first, but your roommate or your friends. Uh, they don't have stuff to do first. Maybe they're in a different program and they don't happen to have something that's due uh, on Friday afternoon like you do. Uh, that's going to be a time when you don't want to go out and yet you keep thinking about it and then you get the FOMO feeling, which is everybody's out there having fun and I'm here in the library. Uh, and the more that happens, the harder it is to delay the gratification. It's going to be St. Patrick's Day all day long, right? So there's no need uh, necessarily to go out. And yet, if people are doing it, uh, it's going to be hard. So let's watch this quick example. It's very short. Uh, and I want to highlight a few examples of the children's behaviors. Uh, those of you that are watching at home can just watch this later because uh, it doesn't come through. Uh, let me pause. And let me embiggen this a bit here so we can... Um, it's only three minutes long. So the idea is this goes back to a study, some studies that were done in the 1970s by Walter Mitchell at Yale University. Uh, and he was interested in self-control, uh, which is related to inhibitory control. But it's the idea that you can control your own decisions. How much effort does it take for, uh, does it take to be able to inhibit something and to control your behaviors? And this is an, an example of something like one of the experiments he did. We'll talk about the experiments in more detail right afterwards. Uh, but the idea is that you inhibit something. Uh, and in this case, children are presented with something that's desirable. It wasn't always a marshmallow, but the marshmallow is the funniest one. It's a funny sounding word. Uh, and so it became known as the marshmallow test. Uh, so you're given a marshmallow, right? And you're told you can have this marshmallow anytime you want, but you can't, I'm going to leave the room. Don't eat it while I'm gone. If you want to eat it, call me back in. But if you can wait until I come back in a few minutes later, you can have two marshmallows. So it's an exercise in delayed gratification. Am I going to eat it now? Can I wait for a minute? Can I wait for 10 minutes and be rewarded with two? How long can I delay gratification? And the critical thing that we'll see in the next few slides when I talk about the experiment is is having the reward in front of you more difficult? Uh, so is it harder for these kids because they're literally looking at a marshmallow? They're smelling the marshmallow. Marshmallows have sort of that sticky, kind of sickeningly sweet vanilla smell to them, right? So you're sitting there, you got a marshmallow in front of you. There's nothing else. You have no distractions. Uh, having it in front of you makes it really hard to ignore.
Alright, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you another for the new one too. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? All right. Kids don't like to stay in chairs to begin with, uh, so there's that. He's concentrating. They have nothing else to do but look at this marshmallow. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is to watch their facial expressions and their uh, physical activity. You'll notice that a lot of them spend, in addition to spending a lot of time looking at the marshmallow, uh, you can see the conflict uh, in their eyes. That particular boy right there, you can see him looking at it, smelling it really closely, trying to get a good sense of that marshmallow. Uh, and then he sort of rolls his eyes a little bit, like he knows that he has to try to wait. He wants to sort of force himself to wait as long as possible. Another thing you'll notice is some of the younger kids, uh, the obviously younger looking kids, uh, are much less likely to do that. Um, and you'll see some of the kids really fidget a lot and move, trying to expend additional, uh, you know, the energy that they would normally use, the cognitive energy that you would normally use to sit still, which also takes some degree of self-control. Uh, is no longer there, right? So you're putting all your self-control on avoiding the marshmallow and your arms and legs are going all over the place, right? So it's harder, you don't have as much resources uh, and you'll sort of see that in their behavior uh, as they go. He also can't help himself, he's not looking at it, but he's touching it. trying to distract himself. And that's also important too, is distraction. They're also hoping they can get away with it. Okay. See, these are the kids that are, they're moving around trying to distract themselves. Little kids don't bother with this action, obviously. The older ones can bother. Conflict. A little bit of cheating. <laughs> I mean, arguably, she's made the right decision. Uh, she was allowed to eat it now. Maybe she doesn't need two marshmallows. I do. He's very proud of himself. You did? You did? You want to eat it. I mean, yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. they're both. She cleaned up after herself, so good for her. Um, so one of the things, as I mentioned, one of the things I wanted you to pay attention to was some of their behaviors. And also the idea that there isn't really a right answer here. Uh, system one, which is the fastest, easiest thing, and clearly what the little the two or younger children had, uh, the girl who ate the marshmallow right away, uh, wasn't necessarily making a good or bad decision, right? It's not as if waiting is necessarily the right decision. Uh, let's be honest, one marshmallow is probably enough. Uh, and she was given the option to eat it right now and maybe didn't want the extra marshmallow. So we don't know. Uh, and she made a decision that probably made sense to her at the time, although she wasn't thinking about it in that way. 
Uh, she was hungry for a marshmallow. The marshmallow was there. Why should I wait for a second marshmallow when a marshmallow is here? But some of the other older children waited a little bit longer because they also were learning to control themselves. And that's Michelle's point, uh, is that as we develop and as we get older, we grow in the ability to exercise self-control. So it's not necessarily that the marshmallow is uh, emblematic of anything in particular, or that uh, it's the right or the wrong decision to have one now or to wait. Uh, the issue is that as we get older, uh, we gain the ability, we develop the ability to engage in self-control. Uh, and that that ability can have uh, consequences later on. Uh, that academic performance, our society is one and culture is one that values certain kinds of academic performances. Uh, so the ability to maybe study a little bit uh, when your friends are doing uh, St. Patrick's Day, for example, might be in a, a something that's related to self-control. Neither one is the right or the wrong decision, uh, but most of us need to be able to develop or want to be able to develop some self-control uh, so that we have it when we need it. And it's a, the point is you're training yourself uh, to develop this self-control so that when it's needed, uh, you've got it. Let's go back to our lecture here. Um, pull this out of the way. Context effects. Um, how do I make this bigger from here? I feel like I don't know how to make it bigger once it gets small, so I end up just doing this again. And then I get lost. Same sort of thing happened the last time. I guess we'll just wait here for a while as OneDrive decides. So I can either see my slide now or I can wait 10 minutes and see both of my slides. I'm not really asking a lot of OneDrive. I'm just asking it, oh yeah, well, that's obvious that it's unresponsive, I mean, why tell me now? It's self-evident. Let's go ahead and start the whole process over again. Context effects, there we are. Okay, so as I mentioned, Walter Michel is the psychologist, the developmental psychologist who is most interested in this. Um, and what he was interested in was uh, the development of the delay of gratification. So it's a cognitive skill uh, that most of us take time to develop, just like any of the other cognitive skills and behaviors that we develop over time, communicating, language, reading. Uh, we learn to do lots of things when we're young kids, and learning how to control uh, impulses is one of them. Um, and so we carried out a number of experiments kind of in this general marshmallow test uh, setting. Uh, for example, um, here might, th this, you know, they could have uh, a variety of things. Let's look, here's what they told their subject. Let's see what's under here. I bet it's a surprise. Oh boy, look at that, a marshmallow and a pretzel. Which one would you like to eat? You can eat either the marshmallow or the pretzel. Um, so they gave the kids a choice, right? We don't want to assume that everybody likes marshmallows. I'm assuming that everybody chose the marshmallow and not the pretzel, but it's important to give them a choice. Um, oh, you know what? I have to go out of the room now. And if you wait until I come back by myself, then you can eat this one, picking up the chosen object. Uh, but, you know, if you don't want to wait, you can ring the bell and bring me back anytime. So it's a little different from the example that we saw. They were given the option to choose what they liked. They were then told they can have it, the experimenter needed to leave, and they couldn't eat it while the experimenter was gone. They could either wait until the experimenter came back at an undetermined time, or if they couldn't resist, they could ring the bell and call the experimenter back in so that they could then engage uh, in eating the marshmallow. But if you ring the bell, then you can't have this one, you can have that one. So in the first version of the task, that's the trick. 
right? You choose the marshmallow, but if you ring the bell, you have to eat the pretzel, uh, which is not nearly as good as the marshmallow or vice versa. Um, so if you ring the bell and bring me back, then you can't have the marshmallow, but you can have the pretzel. Um, and in some conditions, uh, and this, this sort of summarizes a lot of the different experiments, uh, sometimes they were given distractions. Uh, and this is what the children in the video, without any particular distractions, were finding distractions, either popping their head, uh, you know, moving their hands around, uh, bouncing the marshmallow up and down. They were trying to do something. Uh, one kid was like sort of fingering the marshmallow, but not looking at it. Uh, another kid was staring directly at it and trying to taste it. They were all trying to do something uh, to keep themselves from being distracted or to distract themselves. So in some conditions, they were given overt distraction. Child was left alone with a potential distracting activity that involved playing with a toy, in this case, a slinky. Who wouldn't want to play with a slinky? Uh, in group one, each subject was also given the de delay of gratification contingency instructions. That's if you can wait. Um, and waiting was a possible of getting the preferred food object if you waited long enough. In group four, the child was left alone merely to play as long as he wished. In both of these groups, prior to leaving the room, the experimenter placed the slinky on the floor and informed the child they could play with the slinky on the floor as long as they wanted, and they could ring the bell whenever they wanted to bring back the experimenter, regardless of whether the children child rang the bell or wanted. He could play with the slinky when the experimenter came back. So they give him lots of stuff to do. Um, in other groups, uh, they were given cognitive inducing instructions. Before leaving the room, the experimenter gave the subject instructions designed to encourage the child to generate their own thoughts and convert cognitive activities while waiting. He said, oh boy, while I'm gone, can, you can think of anything that's fun to think of as long as you want. Can you tell me something about to think about that's fun? Uh, so the idea is if you don't have a physical distraction like a slinky, uh, you could tell the child, you know what? It's easier to wait if you think about something fun. What is a fun thing to think about? Uh, and then you've given the child something else uh, to focus their attention on. Um, the experimenter paused for the child's examples and said, yes, no matter what, the, I always liked that part, as if the kid was gonna come up with something that was not fun to think about in the experiment. So you know what, that, Billy, that's, not, that's actually not fun. I think you need a better, more fun example. Uh, the experimenter added other examples. You can think about singing songs, playing toys, or anything that's fun to think of. Um, so here's an example of some of these, uh, some of the results. Uh, and the y-axis shows mean waiting time. So the higher means you could wait longer. Uh, eventually children, uh, either the experimenter comes back uh, or they ring the bell. And this is across several different experiments. Um, so when the award, rewards were available for attention, in other words, the, award was, the reward was right there in front of them. Uh, the marshmallow is sitting right there. Um, and they're not given anything to do uh, or no distractions or nothing to think about. They don't wait very long. Uh, the child does not want to be left alone in the room with a marshmallow. No idea when they can eat the marshmallow. So they, they call the experimenter back in and just eat the pretzel. Um, when they're giving something fun to think about in different experiments, they can wait longer. Uh, when they're given uh, the idea to just focus on getting the reward, which in this case was the marshmallow and not the pretzel, they can still wait a little bit longer. Uh, so a cognitive intervention, telling the child, you know what, you can wait a little bit longer if you think about something fun, or you can wait a little bit longer if you focus on what you will achieve just by waiting. So these are simple cognitive behavioral interventions, just letting the child know some, that they have some cause or agency in this process. Uh, here's what you can think about. If you can think about that marshmallow and how good it's going to taste when you get when I get back, you can wait a little bit longer, you'll be able to get it. Um, when the rewards were not available for attention, so they weren't seeing the things that they were supposed to get, uh, they could wait longer, except in the case when they were told to think about the reward, uh, in which case their waiting time decreased because although it wasn't there, they were then asked to focus their attention on something, uh, which made it more desirable again. So I said this has implications. One of the things that has made this effect, uh, I think, of greater interest to developmental and educational psychologists is that you've all been through the school system, right? You've been through kindergarten and primary school, uh, elementary school and secondary school. And a lot of the younger parts of your school are about learning to delay gratification, 
right? I mean, you probably remember what it was like to be in kindergarten or grade one or grade two, uh, or if you have siblings uh, who are in kindergarten or grade one, or if you have uh, you know, friends or uh, family members who are teachers, you know what it's like to deal with young children. Uh, a lot of that is helping them develop the capacity uh, to regulate their behaviors and to regulate their emotions, right? Uh, there's a reason kids have to sit at a certain time and they're all told to stand up and they're all told when to sit down and they all get together uh, and go out. So it's not a free for all, right? It's not an optional free for all where kids are doing everything. Uh, the idea is there's some chance to develop uh, proper self-control. So our school system, from preschool to university, uh, and this is, we're gonna look at uh, children from preschool and university, uh, are involved with exercising self-control. That's why I brought up the example of smartphones or uh, having fun for St. Patrick's Day, is that likely there are gonna come times when you need to exercise some self-control. You've got multiple competing goals. You've got friends who wanna do this, another group of friends who wanna do this. You also have a class and you have responsibilities with family. You need to prioritize those things. And sometimes that means inhibiting uh, something that's more immediately desirable. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can uh, ask uh, adolescents. So parents of adolescents were asked to rate their children, their adolescent children, uh, on a series of things with something called the Adolescent Coping Questionnaire Items. How likely is your child uh, to be sidetracked by minor setbacks? Um, how likely is your child to exhibit self-control in frustrating situations? So this isn't a perfect measure, but it's an observational member, uh, measure. Asking parents to self-report confidentially on their, their children's tendency uh, to uh, pursue goals, uh, to be motivated, uh, to maintain friendships. And they compared that with uh, their performance when the children were preschoolers. So the same kids, so imagine those young kids in that video uh, at age seven, 10 years later, their uh, parents are at being asked, how likely is your child to exhibit self-control? Uh, so the same kids that you saw exhibiting self-control or not are then being asked 10 years later by their parents uh, to sort of rate them on a whole series of behaviors. Uh, they may not even remember exactly being in the study, uh, but they were in the study. So what they've done is they've looked at the relationship uh, between uh, when these rewards were exposed, for example, uh, and waiting time. And what you can see is some a lot of significant correlations. In other words, uh, this correlation here, how likely is your child to be sidetracked by minor setbacks, suggests a tendency uh, to not uh, engage in self-control as well. Uh, because if you're likely to be sidetracked, it means that your ability to focus on long-term goals might not be as well developed as you'd like it to be. Um, that seems to be negatively correlated with waiting time when you were a preschooler. In other words, you didn't wait as long uh, and you're more likely to be sidetracked. Um, you see the reverse significant correlation with how likely is your child to exhibit self-control in frustrating situations? parents who rated their children as being likely to exercise self-control in frustrating situations 10 years earlier or waiting longer amounts of time. Uh, and so it suggests that your performance on these early uh, tests of self-control are not a one-off deal, right? Uh, that individual difference seems to persist uh, throughout uh, childhood and throughout adolescence, suggesting that these individual differences uh, are possibly related to some kind of biological temperament, uh, that the tendency to be able to inhibit uh, self-control is something that's present when you're a young child. And although it develops as you get older, uh, you might still have uh, a tendency to exercise more or less uh, self-control. But it isn't necessarily the case that you're doomed. <laughs> right? Uh, if you couldn't wait on that marshmallow, it doesn't mean that your entire life is that I'm not able to wait uh, a few extra minutes for a marshmallow. Uh, one of the things you see is that most of these correlations disappear when some of the interventions uh, were uh, introduced. So early on, uh, cases where children were given something to think about uh, and could wait longer, um, there doesn't seem to be a correlation. So those interventions suggest cognitive ways to deal with uh, the tendency to 
uh, have difficulty with self-control. So it isn't necessarily the case that you're sort of, you know, doomed <laughs> uh, to eat the marshmallow immediately. But it does suggest that there are these biological or possibly personality or temperament related uh, issues that persist and that will then affect your ability to make decisions. Uh, what we would expect to see later on is that individuals with reduced uh, capacity for self-control uh, will develop those abilities a little bit less well uh, and may be more likely to re you know, uh, rely on system one. Uh, which means they're potentially more prone to occasional biases, uh, whether it's representativeness or availability uh, and so on. Uh, in terms of academic performance, you wouldn't be surprised to see that these same correlations are strong uh, in the strongest rewards exposed spontaneous ideation experiment, because that's the, that's the condition that's closest to the one that was shown in the video. The reward is right there and you're not given any kind of particular distractor. Uh, whatever you use is spontaneous. Um, that it is also correlated with performance on standardized tests. Uh, so your, your ability to focus on a standardized test when you're doing, uh, most of us, uh, if you're all, if you've all grown up, uh, grown up in the Canadian school system, uh, you don't normally take the uh, SAT test, but in the US, the SAT test is a standardized test for university and college admissions. Uh, most colleges, uh, most universities use uh, the SAT in conjunction with grades uh, to give you some sense about whether or not uh, somebody has the academic uh, qualifications to be admitted into university. Um, and you can see there's this strong positive correlation with waiting time uh, and performance on these standardized tests. Um, let's switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about uh, regulatory focus. Uh, and this will uh, also focus on goal attainment. Uh, so one of the things that's clear in the uh, marshmallow uh, study uh, is that children, whether they are trying to wait a long time uh, or whether they're trying to wait less time, are trying to achieve the goal of getting to marshmallows, right? Uh, they're focused on some kind of goal. Uh, and there's some kind of self-regulation there. Uh, in some cases, many of us are regulate our decisions and emotions based on achievement uh, what can we do to achieve a certain thing? Uh, versus sometimes some of us focus on prevention. What can we do to keep what we already have and not lose it? Those are two different ways to think about something. So spend the next 15 minutes uh, talking about regulatory fit, uh, and then we'll take a break. Uh, so we'll go until about uh, 10 uh, 40 or 10 45 at the latest. Does that seem reasonable? Can you regulate uh, your attention? the next 15 minutes to get through this next thing. And then you can have, I should have brought a bag of marshmallows or two just for fun, but I didn't think about it until right now. Um, the next time I'm gonna remember that, I'm gonna bring the marshmallows in, distribute them uh, and say, have your marshmallow now while we're in the middle of class. Uh, so let's talk about approach and avoidance. Approach are, when approach goals are desirable states that you wanna to move towards. Most of us have goals we wanna approach. Right? In most cases for us, I assume you're third and fourth year students, you want to uh, successfully graduate uh, with a university degree, whether it's a major uh, or an honors specialization. Or if you're third year, you want to uh, successfully get into your fourth year. Right, uh, So we have some academic goals that we want to achieve. We have lots of goals that we want to achieve. But we also have avoidance goals, things that we want to avoid. You want to avoid uh, being overloaded. Uh, maybe you want to avoid certain... Uh, scenarios, or maybe you want to avoid uh, failing a class. And sometimes this depends, let's, let's use the academics uh, side of things, uh, it probably depends on where you are in a particular class. Uh, if you are in the 85 range in a class, maybe you're thinking about achieving uh, up to a 90. If you're in the 71 uh, range. Maybe you're thinking about preventing uh, or avoiding getting a little bit lower. So it might depend on the context, uh, and that might be a sensible approach, right? Maybe if you're right above uh, in the sort of the mid 60s, uh, maybe it's better to focus on not going lower. Uh, maybe if you're right at a certain cusp of being pushed into another uh, bin, uh, maybe you want to achieve uh, getting into the next bin. And certain classes have structures that allow both avoidance or 
uh, you know, prevention uh, and promotion. Doing more things might increase uh, your mark in some classes, but in other classes like this, uh, just answering all of the questions on the exam correct uh, is, um, is probably the best way. Um, these goals, whether it's approaching something to gain it or avoiding something to not lose it, interact with a cognitive style known as regulatory focus. Um, and this has to do with uh, focusing your self-regulation energy when you're thinking about things. Most of us have both of these capabilities, uh, but sometimes they're related to personality and temperament, and there are individual differences at play. For example, uh, a promotion focus, whether it's a personality characteristic or a situational characteristic, uh, is a focus on the achievement. Um, it lines up well with approaching goals. Uh, so a promotion focus focuses on the achievement of a desired outcome and possible gains or non-gains in the environment. Someone with a promotion focus is looking to achieve things. You're looking to do more. Someone with a prevention focus focuses on the avoidance of undesirable outcomes uh, or possible losses or non-losses in the environment. So if you're approaching something, if you're dealing with something uh, with a prevention focus, or if you have a prevention focus towards a certain task or scenario, uh, you're, you're focusing on the things that avoid unpleasantness or avoid losing uh, what you already have. You can probably imagine that lots of scenarios, whether they're academic, uh, life scene scenarios, financial situations, uh, involve both of these things. Uh, there are lots of cases where you do want to get more things, right? You want to earn more money, or you want to get uh, a higher mark, or you want to achieve more status, or you want to get to a different level. Uh, those are approaching uh, and promotion focuses. Lots of cases where we want to avoid losing what we already have. Um, what is the difference between a non-loss and like a gain? So a gain is when you're focused on what you uh, stand to gain by doing something uh, without necessarily worrying about what you lose uh, if you make a wrong decision. You're only focusing on getting positive feedback, on getting points, on getting money, uh, or on accumulating friends or social capital or something like that. Those are all gains or things that don't give you a gain. Um, and that is contrasted from a loss, which is, I don't want to lose my friends, I don't want to lose money, uh, or this will not cause me to lose money. So you might focus on whether or not something gives you more uh, or doesn't give you more, that's a gain or a non-gain, or lose what I have versus not lose what I have. Does that help? Gains and losses are only two sides of it. So you can either gain something. Yeah, I guess like the gain and loss, it's more like the non, like I'm thinking of just like how it does. A non, yeah, so a non, like, yeah. Is it just saying like, you know, it's like. You're just not worried, uh, yes. Not so in a, if you're focusing on the gains, you're focusing on what you can do that will help you gain something. Uh, you're not necessarily focused on the occasional loss because you're just focused on, if I do this, what will I get? If I do this, what will I get? This gets me more than this gets me. So this is a, this is a gain and this is a non-gain. Uh, there might be other decisions that would involve losses, but you're not focused on them. Uh, you're focused on just the gain side of things. Um, as opposed to someone who already has something and focuses on what activities will cause me to lose the most uh, this will cause a bigger loss than this. This costs more than this costs. Uh, so they're both losses. Uh, one is a bigger loss. Does that help it make sense? I mean, you're never, none of us are not, you know, we're not one or the other. Uh, both of these uh, kinds of thinking styles uh, are present for most of us when we're making decisions. Uh, a promotion focus, how would it apply in behavior? So how many of you are looking for summer employment? Uh, something to do over the summer, right? Uh, that's a constant set of stress for a lot of people. Uh, you want to be able to, you know, you know, if you're not taking classes over the summer, you want to be able to earn money usually over the summer. So suppose you're looking for summer employment uh, or you're looking for like real employment, right? You're graduating uh, and you're looking for a real job, right? Uh, applying for a new job, there are lots of ways to approach it. Uh, one way is to approach it with this promotion focus. Uh, you're interviewed and you're trying to impress the person. 
uh, during your interview. It's a multi-stage interview. You want to impress them and you strive to present yourself in the best way possible by drawing it attention to things that you, that all of the things that you can do if you succeed in getting the job. So you want to let them know what you've done and also what you will do. If you hire me at your firm, I can do all of this. I'll bring in this money. I'll uh, be able to bring in these clients. I can sell, you know, help you sell more than you've sold before. So you're focusing on what you can achieve, right? Because you want to get that job. So a promotion focus can be really useful uh, when you're applying for a job. The gain, of course, is being offered the job. Uh, so a promotion focus works well for something like uh, applying for a new job. Prevention focus works well when you are at a job and you don't want to lose your job. Right. So here you might draw. So you already have a job, one in which there's a lot of competition. You work at Twitter. Elon Musk just bought Twitter uh, and people are being laid off arbit arbitrarily in massive numbers. Right. You don't want to be one of those people. You want to stay. Right. Um, so you already have a job, one where there's a lot of competition. Drawing attention to all the things you can do might not help in this case. Right? Maybe you don't want to be trying to talk to your manager about all the things you will be able to do because you don't know if those things are in the manager's plan or in the new owner's plan. Maybe you just don't want to make big mistakes. Uh, maybe you just want to uh, focus on what you're doing now and do it really well. In other words, you focus on avoiding a loss. So a prevention focus uh, wouldn't necessarily be the same, wouldn't, a promotion focus wouldn't necessarily be as helpful when you're trying to prevent losing your job. Uh, and so we usually do both of these things, whether it's employment, uh, how long you're in a relationship, you behave differently when you're trying to, uh, you know, when you're attracted to someone and you're trying to start a relationship, that's a promotion focus, right? You're trying to get with somebody and you behave differently than if you're in a longer term relationship and it looks like things are starting to go south, you actually use a prevention focus sometimes, right? So you might focus on the things that can avoid loss or non-loss. You're not trying to gain new relationships when you're in one. You're trying to avoid losing the relationship you have. So they're both good. Uh, but sometimes uh, they clash. So if you are very promotion focused and you're in a place where there are layoffs coming, uh, it might be seen as someone who is promoting themselves right out of a job, right? Well, if you're so good, just take a job over at Meta. Uh, if you're so good, why don't you go just be with him then uh, in instead of with me, right? Uh, so there are lots of cases where it might be a mismatch with the situation uh, if you've got the wrong focus. And we call that regulatory fit. The idea of regulatory fit is that your regulatory focus, prevention or promotion, either fits or doesn't fit with the environment. All things being equal, if you adopt a promotion focus, it fits well for situations when gains are important. If you have a prevention focus, it fits well with situations when losses uh, are important. So promotion focus fits with gain, prevention focus fits with loss. And when you're in a state of regulatory fit, in other words, when you're adopting a regulatory uh, focus that fits well with the environment, you seem to notice and you feel like you're doing the right thing. So there's a feeling of increased cognitive flexibility uh, because you're using fewer cognitive resources to carry things out. In other words, you've adopted the right strategy uh, for the behavior, you've adopted the right strategy for the environment, uh, and you're able to do things a little bit better. There's a feeling of fluency. Uh, you're in the right zone. You're doing things the right way. Uh, you're uh, adopt, You're saying the right things. Uh, you're doing the right things. Now, we've talked about this in big, complex situations like relationships and jobs, um, but it also can come, it also comes out in lower level, simpler situations like small decision-making scenarios uh, or learning scenarios or attentional scenarios. So that's what I want to talk about for the next 10 minutes. Um, I should have actually shown this slide before because this was sort of an alternative way to talk about two ways to achieve a goal. I put this slide in, I think last night and meant to move it around and then I forgot that I had it here. Um, so if your promotion focus on achieving a, an A in a university or college course, 
Uh, you envision success. You read extra material and you attain uh, a, a positive regulatory fit, right? So if you are a promotion focused person and you want to achieve a good mark, uh, this might be the way in which you do it. And this allows you to achieve this regulatory fit. Um, but it, you don't want to envision failure uh, because you don't do enough extra work uh, that would result in a negative outcome for you. But you can see that there are alternative approaches that might get the same thing. Uh, if you tend to be prevention focused, focuses, focusing more on keeping what you have, uh, you might be more vigilant and reading the course outline. Uh, making sure you've done uh, all of the assignments. So it's not doing extra, it's making sure you haven't missed something. Uh, those are two different ways to approach your university career. Um, a prevention-focused person might also be able to achieve a state of regulatory fit by engaging in those particular behaviors. Uh, so the last uh, experiment I want to talk about before we take a break looks at the attention mechanisms. So I want to use a paper that uses classification learning, so perceptual classification learning. Um, we're going to talk about perceptual classification learning a lot in the next half, too, because I'm going to use it when I talk about mood, and I'm going to use it when I talk about uh, context and uh, cognitive resource depletion. Perceptual classification learning is learning to classify simple objects into one or two or more groups. Uh, and a simple object uh, has features. Uh, those features help predict what category uh, you need to assign the object to. So when we talked about concepts and categories, we were using examples a few slides, a, a few classes ago where they were like triangles and squares in different colors, remember that? Um, and so the idea is you see a shape, you make a decision, you get feedback, and as you start doing that, you come to know what features are associated with one response and what cluster of features are associated with the other response, and you attain some kind of behavioral decision class. Uh, in other words, you come up with a rule for classifying things. So this paper by uh, Maddox, Baldwin, and Markman uh, looked at regulatory fit and perceptual classification learning. Um, and so, they set up two scenarios. In this case, the stimuli that you are learning to classify are lines of a certain angle and a certain position uh, and a certain length on the screen. So you can have three different uh, dimensions. So you're just literally seeing a slanted line on the screen, but they can vary in terms of the slant. They can vary in terms of the length and they can vary in terms of the position where they're, they appear on the screen. Uh, so there are lots of different things you can do with a simple, uh, two-dimensional line. And you need to learn which, series, which, cl which cluster of lines uh, is assigned to category one and which cluster of lines is assigned to category two. But you can also be asked to do this within a gain framework or a loss framework. Uh, and although they look almost the same, um, in each on the gain version of the task, you see an object you make a decision, category one or category two, you get feedback on that, and then you gain points until you reach this bonus, which gives you a little bit of extra money. So your job is to get as many correct answers as possible so that you can reach the bonus, which gives you then like an extra $10 or something like that. So you see a little counter bar, you're on, count, you're on score number 28, um, and then you've got to get to the bonus area. So you're trying to get correct responses. That's a gain task. The loss task, the, the probabilities are the same. The values are the same, but you start out with the bonus and you lose points every time you make a mistake until you get to a point where you no longer have the bonus. Performance can be the same. Uh, if you weren't thinking about the bonus and you were only thinking about correct and incorrect responses and you were just trying to learn the categories, uh, you'd end up in the same position. But if you're focused on trying to get the bonus, this is a gain task, and this is a loss task. Which one of these fits with a promotion focus? Um, if you're in a, um, uh, if you're in this uh, gain version of the task, uh, promotion focus should be the right focus to adopt, right? And a state of regulatory fit would mean that you are doing the right thing for that task which would give you a little bit more cognitive flexibility. Uh, you'd be able to explore different rules. Um, 
if you are in a prevention focus on a loss task, you're also engaging in the right kind of strategy. But if there's a mismatch, uh, you might start engaging in the wrong strategy. So if you're uh, prevention focused and you're given a task that is gain related, uh, you're in the wrong space uh, and you're not gonna be doing things as uh, effectively. So on the next slide, let me show you the way in which these lines were configured in three-dimensional or two-dimensional stimulus space. And I'll explain how the rules work. So we have position, orientation, and, and length. And in this case, you can see that position is not relevant uh, to the category decision. So we actually have, although these are configured in three, there are three different things that vary, position, length, and orientation. Only two of them matter. And in one case, what you need to do is acquire this boundary rule such that things of a certain length and a certain orientation belong to one category uh, and the other lines belong to the other category. So you might say something like uh, things that tilt to the right and are short belong in category one, things that tilt to the left and are long belong in category two. Does that seem clear? So this is known as a two-dimensional rule. Uh, it requires attention to two dimensions, orientation and length, and it can be described verbally. Uh, so lots of other experiments that they've done, some of the pre-testing that they did in this experiment, um, determined that people can verbalize this rule, long right-tilted lines and short left-tilted lines. So it's the kind of thing you can say, uh, which means that if it's a rule, you can test hypotheses. You can test the length hypothesis. You can test the orientation hypothesis. You can test the position hypothesis. You can then learn to inhibit attention to the, in, the position dimension. So you can figure out which dimensions matter, how to combine them, and you can verbalize all of this while you're doing it. Cognitive flexibility helps here because you wanna be able to try all of the different dimensions, try different rules, and see what works. So if you are uh, flexible, if you're in a state of regulatory fit, that flexibility will be increased and your performance should be a little better uh, than someone who is in a state of mismatch. You can also take these lines of different orientations uh, and pull them from distributions that are less able to be described verbally. So this is also a two-dimensional linear boundary between things that are uh, tilted to the right and slightly longer uh, dimension, longer length. Um, and there's also a set of exemplars on the other side of this boundary. This is a rule that can't be described verbally because there are things that are short and long, things that are left and right in both categories. It's the integration of the two dimensions uh, that seems to matter. Now, people can learn this without any difficulty. It's not difficult to learn but it's hard to test hypotheses and it's hard to describe that boundary verbally. If you have increased cognitive flexibility here, um, it might mean that you spend more time searching for rules. So this is a case where flexibility actually hurts. You're better off just saying, you know what? I have no idea how to learn this task, but I kind of got a sense that every time it looks kind of like this, I press the one key and every time it looks kind of like this, I press the two key and I can't describe what I'm doing. I can't uh, verbalize the rule. I can't test hypotheses, but I just sort of have a, just got a sense, right? It's just, this one vibes A and this one vibes category B. I just kind of know what they feel like. Flexibility would actually hurt here. Uh, you kind of just want to go with the flow and see if you can acquire the, the rule gradually. So performance is better for participants in regulatory fit. In other words, in the gain version of this task, uh, than in the loss version of the task. Performance is better for participants in a regulatory mismatch condition. Uh, so if they're uh, promote prevention focused subjects and they're in the loss uh, condition, they're gonna perform better in this case. That's mostly uh, what they found. So for uh, how long it takes you to reach the criterion uh, for one of these tasks, promotion focused uh, subjects perform better than prevention focused subjects. Um, in the other uh, category structure, uh, prevention subjects uh, who are in the state of regulatory fit uh, perform better. 
So you see the same thing for how long it takes you to reach uh, the criterion. Uh, you see the same performance difference uh, for cases where it takes um, for just overall proportion correct. Uh, in that rule-based structure, the promotion-focused subjects uh, did better because they were in a state of regulatory match, regulatory fit. Uh, in the non-rule-based uh, condition, the prevention subjects worked better because cognitive flexibility kind of hurt them. Uh, so if they were in a condition where they were less flexible, uh, they had less access to cognitive flexibility because of this regulatory mismatch, uh, their performance actually increased. They couldn't describe the rule verbally, uh, but they could learn uh, the categories perceptually. Okay, 1048. It took a little bit longer uh, than I thought to get through this. Honestly, it would be nice to have some marshmallows uh, to sort of replenish. Actually, this is going to be important because after the break, we're going to talk about replenishing cognitive resources that have been depleted uh, for things like sitting in a long class. So let's take a quick refresher. Try to be back here at 11 o'clock and we'll continue on with the second half of the class. <laughs>